So this morning we're going to be talking about signs, wonders, and miracles. If you have your Bible with you this morning, I'd like you to turn to Mark, the 16th chapter, and we're going to start at the 16th, or the 15th verse, Mark 16 and 15. And this is Jesus addressing his disciples. Then he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whomever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will drive out demons. They will speak in new languages. They will pick up snakes. If they should drink any deadly thing, it will never harm them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will get well. Now let's talk about the word signs. There's three words I want to bring out here. One's is signs. One of the words is signs. And that word in the Greek is the word semeon. Semeon means a mark, a token, an occurrence transcending the common course of nature. A mark, a token, or an occurrence transcending the common course of nature. And this speaks of miracles and wonders by which God actually uses to authenticate His messenger or His servant and the message that they have brought. So the main purpose for a sign and wonder is to show that A, God is involved in the message that the messenger is preaching. A lot of people say, I, pull, I go to a full gospel church. I preach a full gospel message. I believe everything the Bible says. Well, Jesus said, if you believe, these signs will follow you. What do you need to believe? You need to believe. The word believe here means you believe with absolute confidence in this situation that God will aid you in doing these signs and wonders. So what we're talking about here is miracles, signs, and wonders coming from not only the hands of the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher, but the whole plurality of the body of Christ. See, Jesus said, if you believe, these signs will follow you. So if you say that you're a full gospel preacher, you're a full gospel believer, and you don't have signs, wonders, and miracles following you, like the Word says it will, there is some skepticism I have as a believer that says that you're not preaching a full gospel because the full gospel, Jesus said, would have signs, wonders, and miracles. <clears throat> now, when it says these things are going to accompany you, it means to follow as to be with you always. See, these things aren't just supposed to be with us in church or in church services or in revivals or special meetings. These things are supposed to accompany the believer wherever, they, wherever he or she goes. We are supposed to have these signs following. It is the evidence that who we say we are is who we are. It is the stamp or the badge of authority that God gives us as believers and as the body of Christ. Jesus said, these works that I do you shall do also because I go to my Father. In other words, at that point in time, Jesus was bequeathing his ministry to the body. And to be able to do what Jesus said we had to do, there has to be the corresponding signs, wonders, and miracles, right? That's just logic. You don't have to be a genius to figure out that logically, if Jesus said greater signs would follow us, then he's not a liar, and we know that since he's not a liar, something is missing if we are not having these things happening in our life. It not only means that it's to follow and be present with us always, it also means to be at one side. These empowerments from the Holy Spirit of Jesus, or the Father, are supposed to constantly be with us wherever we go. I can't say that enough. To be always present... And it is called, and it literally is defined as the standard or the rule to confirm oneself as a servant. <clears throat> See, a lot of us think that people with anointings, people that work in gifts, people with the gifts of the Spirit, whatever they may function in, we think that's the exception for those that are called into ministry full time. 
But it's not the exception. It's actually the rule. We didn't make the rules. Jesus said, these signs will follow him that believes. So the next question is, do you truly believe if you don't have signs and wonders following you? Is there a real reality of faith in your life that says, I believe what Jesus said in the gospel is true. Therefore, I'm going to go out and do the works of Christ. Paul said, be ye imitators of me as I also imitate Christ. What did Paul do? Paul was used to raise the dead, heal the sick. He was used to raise the lame in some cases. He was used in prophetic nature. He was used as an apostle. He was used in every manner that he was made available to the Holy Spirit. And that's the other issue we've got to deal with this morning. Are you making yourself available to be used? I hear younger ministers, and I train younger ministers, they say, Frank, I don't have an opportunity to minister. I say, first of all, have you made yourself available to the Holy Spirit to be a minister? <clears throat> See, they think that the, being a minister mainly consists of being here behind the pulpit. This is the glamorous part of the job, folks. This is actually the easy part of the job. It's the things that you don't see that are on the other side of the camera, on the other side of the pulpit, the counseling, the warfare, the intercession, the visiting the sick in the hospitals, the going to people's houses and counseling with them, trying to help marriages and families come back together, bringing healing in those aspects. Those are the less than glamorous aspects that people don't always make themselves available to. James himself said, faith without works is dead. Literally, faith without corresponding action is dead. So if there's no works confirming and authenticating you as the minister of Jesus Christ, then it is doubtable whether your ministry will be truly effective or not. <clears throat> Once again, I'm going to say, in other words, for Christians, signs and wonders are the rule and not the exception. It might not happen at your church. It might not happen in your denomination. But it's irrefutable that the Bible says these signs shall follow. Now, if you're honest with yourself, you can open up the front of your Bible, check it out, and you can open up the last page of your Bible and check it out, and you will see no expiration date on the Word of God. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away before one small part of my Word passes away. Matter of fact, he says a jot or a tittle in the... Elizabethan English, but in um, the um, Hebrew, he would have said an F to a Yod. An F to a Yod is, about, is a, a piece of a letter that's about the size of one of our commas or one of our periods. He said, even before the smallest part of one of my words passes away, all of heaven and all of earth will. <clears throat> so let's talk about the word believe in, in, to, in some detail here. Believe means to have confidence, fidelity, to trust in God's ability to aid in obtaining or doing something. An absolute conviction, trust to which a man is impelled by a certain inner higher prerogative and a law of soul. There is a spirit of God within a believer that compels him with a spirit of compassion I know that what happens to me, God will say, I need you to pray for somebody. And the evidence of that is I will feel the presence of God come on me or start welling up in me. And I will know God has given me a gift for that person. A lot of us say, I have a gift of healing. I have a gift of prophecy. I have this or I have that. No, ladies and gentlemen, you don't have it. You, men, you absolutely are just the conduit for it. You don't possess it. <clears throat> it belongs to God. It is no different when the anointing comes on you to minister than when you walk in your bedroom at night, you cut on the switch and the light comes on. What you have is a switch, which is the Holy Spirit. The anointing comes on you, and you are no different than the wires that are going to that light fixture. It does not belong to you. It might be the gift that you're strongest in. It might be the gift that you're the most anointed in. It might be the one you use most frequently or you're the most developed in. But it does not belong to you. They are the gifts of the Holy Spirit and He uses you to do them. And you'll find that the ones that you use the most are the ones that you are more comfortable with using. You are more 
trusting in God's ability to use them and you are not intimidated in using them. <clears throat> one, of, one of the major gifts in my life is working in the gift of the word of knowledge. That's the one I started out in 20, 30 years ago as a young man. And when it started happening, I was not confident at all. But as I developed it by reason of use, I became so comfortable with it that God uses me everywhere. I might be in a, in a grocery store. I might be in a department store. I might be in a restaurant. And God will say, I want you to speak to that waitress. I want you to speak to that waiter. I even want you to speak to that bartender over there. I want you to speak to this person on the street corner. And I'm comfortable with that now because I have belief. I have absolute confidence that if God tells me to speak to someone right now, that he will do it because I've practiced it. And as you develop your trust in God using you in not only the gifts, but the gifts are signs, wonders, and miracles. By definition, because God uses them for signs, wonders, and miracles. Everyone under the sound of my voice right now, everybody that can see me through this camera right now, you have a particular gifting in your life that God wants to develop you in. You may say, well, I haven't had opportunity. Well, the opportunities that Jesus is wanting us to do are outside the four walls of the church. You have got to get past this thing, I can only minister in church. The predominant part of Jesus' ministry was not in the temple. It was outside in the fields and in the streets and in other people's houses. The church did not start with the edifice complex it has now. I've got to build a fine building. I've got to make a monument unto my greatness, my ministry. No, the church, it says, they were breaking bread from house to house daily. There was a sense of community and everybody had something to give. Everybody had something to share. Everybody had something to minister. They were walking in signs, wonders, and miracles. And the word says that these people had great favor in their community <clears throat> because they didn't keep it in the four walls. Let's go to Hebrews 2, starting at verse 3. I want you to understand that when you become saved, the Word says we become heirs and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. And part of being a joint heir is taking on the family business. Now, we all know somebody that grew up and the family had a business, and then the next generation was trained after they did internships, and then they were raised up to run the business. In essence, this is what has happened to us. Jesus ascended back to the Father, to his rightful place on the throne at the right hand of God, and he gave us the ministry. And Paul's asking a very serious question here. If you read the whole chapter in context, it will help you later. The, the word says, How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord? and was confirmed unto us by them that heard. That was the original 12 apostles. God also, verse 4, God also bearing them witness. Here's your key word. Bearing them witness. Both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and the gifts of the Holy Ghost according to His own will. So that tells you right there, it's according to the will of the Spirit, which gift, which sign, which wonder is manifest. The obligation of the believer is, once again, to make themselves available. <clears throat> if nothing's happening in your life, there's either a shortage of faith or a shortage of availability because there is no shortage of people in need. A lot of us, like I said, we want the glamorous part. We want to be seen by our contemporaries in church. We want to be seen by our peers in church. And, and the ministry in church is like 1% of the actual ministry that Jesus Christ has for you. He said, go into all the world. This isn't even a fraction of the world inside these four walls. 
out there in the region that you live in, in that part of the world, you are the kingdom, you are the hands, you are the feet of Almighty God through Jesus Christ and through His Spirit. You are the one God is willing to use if you are willing to be used. The only big eyes and the only little use in the world are the ones that exalt themselves and the ones that debase themselves to a point where they cannot be used of God because they have no confidence of God. There's only one big eye, and that's the great I am. Everybody else is on equal ground at the foot of the cross. I know you've heard that, and it's become almost cliche. But the fact of the matter is, you can be used of God if you will allow Him to do it. What have you got to do? First of all, you've got to get in that Bible. You've got to study it. You've got to pray in tongues about it. And if you don't pray in tongues, you need to get the baptism of the Holy Ghost because it is He, through the baptism, that empowers you to do the works of Jesus Christ in the ministry. Notice it says, God also bearing them witness. I told you earlier in, the, in, the, in chapter 16 of Mark that God bore witness of His servants. He verified, these are my servants by the signs, wonders, and miracles they did. When it says God bearing them witness, it means literally He came to attest together with them and to unite in adding a testimony. He added to the testimony. Jesus said, You shall bear witness of me in Jerusalem, in Israel, in Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. He, he said, You will bear witness of me, and God will confirm the witness. People say, I preach a word, but there's no power after it. There's no signs and no wonders. Is it a pure word? Is it the truth? Because God only confirms the truth. God does not confirm the watered down. God does not confirm false doctrines. God does not confirm man's philosophies. But what God does confirm is the pure, unadulterated gospel of Jesus Christ, and that's what signs, wonders, and miracles follow after. Bearing witness also means to testify further and jointly in this sense, to unite in adding evidence. God uses signs, wonders, and miracles to make the evidence so irrefutable that you literally have to become blind not to realize God has just moved in my midst. You understand that? When you refuse to see the miracles, the signs, and wonders and say, oh, that's just showmanship, oh, that's just fake. Some of it very well may be, ladies and gentlemen, but when you know that you know that you have felt the power of God, that you have sensed the anointing flowing off God's servants, there is no way to deny you did not feel God when He was moving. God always leaves Himself a witness. And these powerful signs, wonders, and miracles are that witness. They were not created to glorify a man. And I'm sorry, some of the ministers that you've seen on TV and in revivals and stuff walk around like Pentecostal peacocks trying to show off how great they are. The signs were never appointed, intended to point to how great the man was, but how great the God of the man was. And I think that's the reason the Lord has to use the foolish things to confound the wise because we get puffed up in our own wisdom. We become egotistical. And I think that's the reason he uses the weak things to bring down the mighty because God will get the glory then. A lot of you say, I don't have the education. I, I don't have the right socioeconomic status. I came from the wrong side of the tracks. Boy, I could tell you a story about me, but we don't have time for that this morning. I decided when I was a little boy, <clears throat> I saw a great miracle. I saw God create eight inches of leg on a little girl. She was wearing one of those orthopedic shoes that had the stacked sole on it, and the, and the sole was about that tall. And she had to lean up against her mother because she was so little, and the shoe was so heavy that she literally had to sling her leg. <coughs> Excuse me. And I saw the man of God lay hands on her and that leg was recreated right before my eyes. 
And I told God from that moment forward, I said, if you can use me like that, I'm yours forever. <clears throat> it wasn't the preaching that touched my heart. It wasn't the messenger that affected me. But it was the power of God used in that man who served as God's conduit at the time. It was seeing that God was still relevant. <clears throat> that He wasn't like the Bible stories I had read about in Sunday school that were nice little stories that had a good moral at the end of the story. But there was a living power. There was healing virtue. There was miracles still happening in the, my life. And I could see it, that miracles still happened in the world. And I said, God, if I'm going to serve you, I'm going to serve you with power or I can't serve you. And God honored that in my life. In my life, I've seen blinded eyes open. I've seen terminal cancers healed. I've seen people that were losing their mind get restored back to sanity. I've seen families put back together. I've seen people get receive mantles and anointings to go out and duplicate the works of Jesus Christ. I've seen these things with my own eyes. And as my spiritual mentor used to say, he said, Frank, your experience is no other man's argument. No one can convince me now that the signs, the wonders, the miracles, the power of Almighty God is not real. No one can change my mind. I'm absolutely convinced of the fact that God is real. He is relevant and He is more relevant now in this day and this age than he has ever been in any other time to us this generation we can have what they had in the first century church we can see the dead raised we can see the sick healed we can see the lame walk we can see the demons cast out we don't have to compromise for a modern theology a watered down doctrine that makes excuses for how powerless our belief system is The Word says in Matthew 11 and verse 12, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. Now, there's two similar words for violence and violent in, in the Greek here. Both of them speak as to force, pressure applied by those seeking after the kingdom. I will tell you that the violence of the kingdom is the miracles, the signs, and the wonders. These things are spiritual weapons along with the gifts of the Holy Ghost that give you the power that Jesus said to tread on serpents and scorpions that give you power over all the authority and the ability of the enemy. And now, uh, the bonus part about that is with the faith to do these things, it also says, and nothing shall by any means be able to hurt you. A lot of us don't minister in the gifts because we're afraid that there will be a spiritual backlash. And I think that's the reason Jesus put that second part in the verse. He said, and nothing shall by any means be able to hurt you. We have to have the confidence that he that is in me is greater than he that is in the world. We have to have a confidence that this word that I've read is relevant. It is, has a reality to me that transcends just something I've read, something I've, I've acknowledged in my mental capacities, not just mental assent, but I, I, I acknowledge the fact that every word of God is true Amen. and applicable in my life as an individual. See, ladies and gentlemen, it, it doesn't matter if you're sitting here or you're sitting out there. If what you've heard and what you've read is never applied, it is of no use to you or God. In Isaiah 8 and 18, there is a mysterious quotation made here by the prophet. And I think, in my spirit, I've, I've, I've resolved to... It's the pre-incarnate Messiah speaking in first person to the prophet, to the people. Isaiah 8.18 Here I am with the children the Lord has given me to be signs and wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells in Zion. Here I am with the children the Lord has given me. 
to be signs and wonders. Now, he's not only saying they're going to do signs and wonders. What is he actually saying here? The children, he and the children together, working together, are going to be signs and wonders. See, ladies and gentlemen, we've been waiting to see signs and wonders, to do signs and wonders, to do miracles. We've been waiting to see the power gifts released, and you are the gift. Even if you read in context what it says in Ephesians 4, it says, and God gave some. God gave as a gift, literally, if you read the Greek. Some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints to the work of the ministry. So we've got to get past this mindset. Well, I'm not an ordained minister. That's not my profession. That's not my calling. So therefore, I don't have to do these signs, these wonders, and these miracles. No, if you read the context in Ephesians 4, it says that we are here to equip you to do the works of Jesus Christ. That is the ministry, the works of Jesus Christ. People say, I, 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 don't, I don't know if I can do that. Do you love me? The word says, Jesus said, do you love me? If you love me, you will obey my commands. He said, go into all the world. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the leper. Freely you have been given. Freely you have received. Freely give. See, we think it's an option. That was not a request of Jesus. That was a command. It is the prerequisite of being a Christian. Well, like I said, when you get saved, there is an exchange going on. You receive His forgiveness. You receive the blood of Jesus Christ. You receive redemption. The second part of it is you receive His mantle, His ministry, His Holy Ghost, His ministry. His ministry. Did you hear that? His ministry. So all you guys that are out there that are younger and think that it's my ministry, listen to a guy that's 40-something now, gals too, it's not your ministry. It's his spirit. It's his anointing. It's you volunteering. Don't get the big head because somebody gives you a prophecy, you shall preach to nations. That's wonderful. Try doing it without him. It won't happen. See, the fact is that God's Holy Spirit dwells within you and makes you a living, breathing sign and wonder. A lot of people say the greatest miracle is salvation. That's true. But there has to be a corresponding evidence of your salvation. If you say you're saved, there's got to be an evidentiary statement that is played out every day in your life that says, I am indeed saved. I am the man of God. I am the woman of God. I am a child of the Most High. Jesus is my King. If you are going to be an ambassador for Christ, the ambassador carries the full weight of governmental authority. It backs him or her in all that they do. So whatever they say has the authority, the signet seal of the King upon their words, and God will... Honor that with corresponding signs, wonders, and miracles. That is the signet. That is the sign. That is the seal of the ministry. The signs, the wonders, and the miracles are just like when the king used to write a dictate or a decree, roll it up in a scroll, put the wax to seal it, and put his signet ring on it. The signs, wonders, and miracles are the signet to the message. Basically, it's like the political the political um, commercials that we hear every election cycle. This is my message and I approve it. And that's what God's saying when He does these things in power. You see, the, king, the kingdom of heaven, Jesus said, resides in you. Jesus literally said, the kingdom of heaven is within you. And in the plurality in the Greek it says, in you and among you all. So we have equal call. The mantles might be different. The ministry flowing from you might be different. But we have an equal responsibility to reflect that light of Jesus Christ, to reflect His character, His integrity, His ministry. And everything that we do has to bring forth a representation of the King and His kingdom. 
See, that kingdom that's within you is residing there, waiting for someone, you, to release it. I, I pick on, on the, the folks at both of the churches that you know we started, and I say, a lot of you are waiting for permission for someone to release you into the ministry, to tell you it's okay to go and do it. I say, well, if you haven't had anybody tell you yet, I give you permission, go do your ministry. Go do it. You don't have to wait on anybody to go out and lay hands on the sick. You don't have to wait on anybody to go and pray for people. You don't have to wait on anybody to go and do good works. Because unfortunately there are a lot of insecure pastors out there that won't release you because they might be afraid that you are more anointed than they. See, I don't have that lack of confidence in who I am because I'm, I'm okay with who I am. I know what I'm called to be. And when you are secure in your identity in Jesus Christ, nothing else threatens you. Amen. I'm not called to go certain places. I'm not called to do certain things. But I'm going to do what I'm called to do to the best of my ability to honor my Father, to honor my King. And that's what God is expecting from each individual here and watching by camera right now, watching through these, this lens right now. God is expecting you to do what He called you to do. He's not asking you to compete with the guy down the street to build a bigger ministry than this other guy down here. What He's saying is you do what I called you to do. You be concerned with what I have for you to give to other people and everything's going to turn out right. The biggest problem we have today is spiritual pride, ego, and competition in the church. You didn't see the early church competing with each other. The only thing they were trying to compete with is, how, how can I bless you more than you blessed me? How can I one-up you on a blessing? Not how great I am, how much better my, my, um, my spiritual authority is, how much more powerful, how much more articulate a speaker I am, how much more my anointing is powerful than yours. No, it's how can I bless you? <clears throat> how can I honor my God? What can I do to make God pleased with my service? How can I cause the heart of God's Spirit to rejoice? And that's what it's all about. Letting that love, that joy of the Father permeate you. The relationship is, I want to be pleasing to Father. And the way I please Father, the way I please Jesus, the way I please Holy Spirit is to do the works of Him that sent me. And that's all of us. That's not just one of us. You see, when the kingdom resides in you and it's released, it is the ultimate evidentiary statement that God is in fact alive. He is real. He is thriving and He is well and He is concerned with you. You are the evidence. I've already said, like it says in Isaiah 8.18, Here I am with the children the Lord has given me to be a sign and to be a wonder. Instead of waiting for signs and wonders, ladies and gentlemen, in, instead of waiting for that spontaneous moment where I get the opportunity to minister, why don't you just accept the fact that you are the sign and the wonder? Why don't you just accept the fact today that when you received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that you were empowered to become a sign and a wonder? See, God is waiting on a people that are going to stand up. A lot of us have been praying, God, for that last great move of God, that last great revival. They, they want change in the, in the church so these things can happen. Can I give you some advice I've learned over uh, 35 years of being saved? You can wait as long as you want and nothing will change. To have change, you must be the change you desire. You must be the change you desire. You must be the lightning rod that has the cause and effect happening with you. Why do I say that? If you have the Spirit of God dwelling on you, and you are the lightning rod that draws that Spirit of God, you will start, you will begin to affect the very atmosphere, the very circumference of everybody around you. You will be 
the cause and effect that God has for the nations. You can be that very one. You might not reach thousands. You not, might not reach millions. But there's somebody every day that you can touch. And if you add the days of your li- life up and you say, Lord, I've reached one or two people every day this week. And you start multiplying those weeks times years and those years times decades and those decades over a lifetime. You will have reached hundreds if not thousands of people. That's the plan. Not just huge crusades. See, we've lost the simplicity of the gospel. Preach it and then let God use you in signs and wonders. That's the simplicity of the gospel. Jesus said, go forth saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And when we say that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, in the modern vernacular we're saying the kingdom of heaven is now at your fingertips. It's within your grasp. I represent the kingdom of heaven. Touch me. Touch me. There may be some of you watching right now that don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior. If nothing else, I want to assure you that a relationship with Jesus is real. He is real. He did die for you and He loves you. A lot of you have been waiting on something real. There's nothing more real than the kingdom of God. There's nothing more real than Jesus. There's nothing more real than Holy Spirit or Father. The Word says in John 3.16 that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. I want you to pray with me right now while you're watching. I know there's some of you right now that don't know Jesus Christ. You just think that by accident you're going to investigate what this crazy guy in the leather trench coat and the funny colored hair is doing today. Here's the truth about it. God saved me. And as Paul said, I was chief among sinners. I know if God could save me, He can save you. You you think that things are going on so bad that can't be changed, but I can tell you, God can turn your whole life around in this moment. So pray with me. Say, Father, forgive me for my sins. I believe what Frank said, that Jesus died, was crucified, dead and buried. He was the substitute sacrifice for my sins. I know He rose again according to your word on the third day. And I ask you to forgive me for my sins and cleanse me of them. And the next part is this simple. Jesus, I ask you to come in and be my Lord and my Savior. I give you my life to do with what you will. Use me, Lord. Fill me now. Baptize me in your Holy Spirit. And I will serve you all the days of my life. If you just said that prayer, you are saved, ladies and gentlemen. You are saved. God loves you and God wants to use you. I would challenge you to find a church that preaches the true gospel of Jesus Christ. If you don't have a Bible, go out and buy one. Find somebody that has one. If you don't understand it, find somebody you trust that you know understands the Word of God. But whatever you do, don't remain idle. Don't sit there expecting for it to fall in your lap. There is an adventure ahead of you. God is waiting to use you, and it will be the greatest adventure of your life. Remember, you are the sign, you are the miracle, and you are the wonder. God bless you.